Hi, and welcome to Stressed, the podcast to develop your stress resilience. Being ambitious and successful while living a happy life is possible. Learn how you can better cope with stress in day-to-day -day situations by applying tools and techniques that work for you. My name is Julia Arndt, and I'm extremely grateful that you decided to check out my podcast today. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. I am super excited to welcome the next interview guest to my podcast today. And it's no other than Rory Conroy, um, who I had the pleasure working with for a couple of years, a couple of years ago. And since then, we've been in very strong contact. And I'm uh, very, very grateful that Rory has crossed my life and crossed my path. And I'm super excited to welcome him today. Hi, Rory. Julia, hey, how are you? Thanks really so much for having me. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I'm super excited about this conversation today with you. And before we jump in, let's pick up the people a little bit and tell us where you are and what time it is of the day and what you've been up to today. Excellent. So I'm based here in the west of Ireland in the little city called Galway. It is just gone past 5 p.m. So I'm coming towards the end of our working day. Um, and I had a busy day, really busy day. So uh, we organized uh, the troops here in the office to uh, march for uh, climate change. So okay. we congregated uh, here just after lunchtime in Galway uh, with a lot of other uh, different organizations to uh, send a message uh, to the world uh, that, uh, that, that action is, is needed. And it's definitely a big part of our culture in Sightminder and how we work is uh, not just uh, looking after the four walls of the business, but also the wider environment and, 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 and all of that. So that was today. Um, mm -hmm. Wrapping up the week, so I work for a company called Sightminder. We're a, uh, an Australian uh, headquartered uh, software uh, company. So mm -hmm. Australia uh, go offline, given that they're nine hours ahead of us uh, mm -hmm. as we start the day. So mm -hmm. very much kind of closing out the week, uh, finishing off any kind of uh, end of week uh, connections with, the, with HQ early this morning. Um, and... Uh, setting up for the, for the week ahead so yeah it's been a, a pretty busy 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 day but um fridays are, are usually good days it's a, a great vibe in the office and yeah. for a change we've got a, a lovely sunny uh weekend ahead of us in, in in galway so people are pretty optimistic yeah nice that's awesome good weather in ireland is always good news right <laughs> absolutely absolutely nice um, so tell us a little bit more about yourself. You already mentioned that you're working for Sightminder. Um, tell us a little bit more about your path. And you actually just said um, while we were jumping on the podcast that um, my, my new setup reminds you of your old radio days, um, which I totally forgot about. So why don't you start there? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I started off on radio and uh, not as a DJ. Um, I'm from the west of Ireland, uh, just north of Galway, about an hour. So mm -hmm. I started off my professional career um, in radio sales and marketing in Dublin. And mm -hmm. um, so I worked for two radio stations there. And uh, that's my first big boy job. So mm -hmm. it came on the back of uh, doing an undergrad in IT and telecoms and postgrad in advertising. So mm -hmm. I came in, I started in a pretty junior position working with the ad agencies in Dublin. Uh, Not quite exactly what mad men might picture ad agencies as, but sometimes not too far away from it. And it's a great experience. Uh, very focused on relationship selling. Uh, really got a great feel for business and how business is uh, discussed, uh, negotiated, um, you know, concepts of, of ideas. And particularly in radio, you're selling the invisible. So that was back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, It's much more advanced now in terms of being data driven, uh, but back then you were telling stories, and I learned to to tell stories and to be able to paint pictures and 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 really focus on benefit selling um, mm -hmm. rather than features, because obviously we didn't have data to sell features. So um, that was great. I I stayed there for six years, um, mm -hmm. and I kept um, I kept chasing my boss's job back then. So. Mm -hmm. I wanted his job. So he was the head of kind of direct sales when I came in uh, and he was over agency sales as well. So I wanted to emulate him, a guy called Michael Brady. Um, and uh, I was successful moving up into the sales management job um, and then uh, into a sales director role then for both, nine, both, both the two radio stations, 98 FM and Spin. 
Um, but it came to a point where I didn't want his job anymore. He was the CEO uh, of uh, the ra- one of the radio stations at the time. And we've become uh, very close over the years. And for me, it was a, a decision to move into something very different, which is when Google uh, arrived uh, arrived, and uh, I, I jumped at the opportunity to, to, to move to Google back in 2008. Mm-hmm. And I would say for the first six months in Google, I was trying to leave Google. I found mm-hmm. the change from a very emotionally charged um, yeah, personality-led, non-data-driven environment, which radio was, um, after six years, uh, that shift into probably the most, one of the most digital, yeah, data-driven organizations in the world. I find it incredibly difficult. And I'd been managing for a couple of years at that stage. Uh, I'd also completed a part-time master's in strategic management while I was in the radio station. Mm-hmm. And I guess my leadership style had been more of as teacher, um, and you know, I was a, a subject matter expert in what I did, so I could teach better than anyone else. But then I moved to Google, and I lost that unique selling point overnight. So I totally <laughs> felt like I lost my identity, my confidence, mm-hmm. um, and um, I didn't really. I, I suppose I, I had only ever had one manager before that, and I didn't one hundred percent click with the manager I had there, which was more, I think, in reflection about my struggled to make that shift than it was her uh, her management style um but six months later i had a new manager and a, a new perspective um at the time back in uh 2000 early 2009 um google had recently fairly recently acquired youtube and was really looking to grow the display and video space um as given some depressed markets at the time, and the uh, the growth from PPC was starting to stagnate. So, mm-hmm. and Google was far behind the curve in terms of being number one outside of uh, outside of uh, pay per click. So that, I suppose, that ability to sell benefits and tell stories and be able to um, uh, paint pictures in the minds of people was definitely something that was in big need in Google and something that I could add a lot of value to. So, I spent some great years in Google. Uh, then dad got sick and I left Google. I made a decision of the heart rather than the head. Um, he took a heart attack young, um, but very quickly recovered. Um, so I, uh, I actually got back in contact with Google like three months later and said, hey, things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes that happens, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, so listen, Google were great. They interviewed me for three jobs. They offered me all three and I, I just gave them the feedback that you know, based on the circumstances, whichever is the most important, you know, I, I'm very happy to take it. So mm-hmm. I actually ended up moving into a, a, a really interesting role of uh, developing markets for inside sales. So managing and opening up new markets for like so Russia, Poland, uh, Turkey, Israel, the MENA region, um, Portugal, Greece. So it's my first real experience working and managing and leading such a multicultural uh, um, group of individuals that on paper through recent wars and politics and everything that goes with it they shouldn't get along but i have to say is one of the teams that i have to say had a, a really really close uh, relationship uh, with each other and um i i learned an awful lot about i think communication and how to build teams uh, with very different ingredients um mm-hmm. which uh, served me well from my next move from google which is when we started to get to know each other a little bit mm-hmm. i think julia back when i when i started working with the german swiss austrian account management team um uh towards the end of my time in google so yeah that was google i did five years then there i, I guess i probably lost um not so much lost but i kind of really started to think about my impact and the difference my work made i i, I think and i hope i definitely had an impact on the people i worked with directly but you definitely had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely had. I feel like every time I talk to anyone who knows you says that, you know, you changed their life. So I think. Oh, that's God. It. Hopefully for the better. Um, I think so. Yeah. But that's what it's all about. And listen, I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll get into the chat on, on a bit later. But like, mm-hmm. you know, work is work, but it can be a lot more than that. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's not just a switch where you're either working and you're not working. I think you have to be emotionally connected to what you do and you have to really give a damn about the people involved because companies mm-hmm. aren't built on software alone or on ideas. It's built on people who connect with other people in a way that um, makes those businesses successful. So, 
yeah, I really appreciate the time in Google, but I, I, I guess I, I kind of felt I, 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 I wanted to be in probably a higher risk, potentially a higher reward situation and, and, and organization. So the former head of Google at the time, uh, Google Sales in North America, Suresh Khan, I had just moved to a startup called Abdul, a uh, San Fran uh, startup, and he'd approached me and one or two others to uh, move uh, uh, to Adderall and set up their EMEA headquarters in Dublin, which um, which I did. Um, had three years there, I'd say. I had some great years there uh, and great times. I definitely had some of the toughest personal and professional times there as well. Um, mm. And you learn a lot about growth. And we were going through a hyper growth stage. We just received a, a large round of funding and we're opening offices and growing really, really fast. And Fast isn't, nor is it often good, um, and 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 the effect that has on culture and the pressure that comes with it is uh, it is something uh, that is uh, it it can sometimes be hard to describe to someone who hasn't gone through it, but it's something that does stay with you for a long time mm-hmm. um, because of the the emotions and the situations that um, hyper growth expectations uh, bring upon a, a business, which again is made up of. Uh, of people that that are trying to deal with these type of situations for the first time. So, um, and then my final move is where I ended, where I ended up today. So um, I'm from. I was at that time obviously based in Dublin. Um, uh, myself and my wife are both from the west of Ireland. Uh, we had two kids at the time, and my oldest Ben was getting close to school age, and we were kind of we're making a decision: do we put an extension on the house, which would very much. Uh, connect us to the, the the east of the country for a long time um, and Ben would be starting school there would we make the, the brave move to move back to the west of Ireland um, where we're both from and, uh, and, 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 and build our lives there so we, we took the latter option and I was super lucky and fortunate that SiteMinder came along um, mm-hmm. so as I said SiteMinder is a, um, a, the, the leading acquisition platform for hotels in the world we've got over 37,000 customers um, and the majority of those sit in Europe. So you got about 15, 16,000 uh, of, of that number all sitting in the European marketplace. So it's a strange dynamic where the headquarters isn't where the largest constituent of customers yeah. of growth is. Um, so I, I, I started back on the 2nd of August uh, 2016 um, as the general manager uh, of Galway uh, and to launch the Galway office. Um, and my first day in the job was uh, literally half an hour on the first day into the first day I was standing in front of the Irish media TV radio and print wow. uh, together with the, the the minister for jobs and, and and employment at the time announcing that we we're bringing 100 jobs to Galway uh, which for a SaaS company and um, uh, uh, which we are and, and kind of being in the tech scene was a, it was and still is a, a big deal uh, to, to the west coast of Ireland so mm-hmm. um, it's been a roller coaster we hired probably about 80 people in the first 100 days, um, which uh, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend to <laughs> anyone, my God. Um, but um, there, there, there's definitely very important business reasons why we had to scale quite quickly. Um, mm. And uh, our existing uh, European office uh, was and, and, uh, and, and still is in London, mm. uh, but we we're scaling uh, our frontline uh, support teams and our onboarding customer teams here in Galway. Uh, to shift the responsibility for Europe to the Galway office uh, while maintaining a strong sales and, and marketing uh, workforce out of uh, London, which we've actually scaled even more in the recent past. So it's been a roller coaster. Um, I then took on the London office as well. So I was the MD of EMEA since um, uh, since uh, March of 2017. Um, so I did that for just over two years. So I split my time between Galway and every second or third week, I'd be over in London for a couple of days. So um, super stressful, if I'm being honest. It was good. Yeah. Like, I enjoyed it. I had a great connection, I feel, with both offices. But uh, definitely the, the personal side of managing um, what uh, was a, a pretty hectic schedule with uh, a family of two that had just grown to three um, was, a, was, was, was definitely a, a struggle. Um, but in more recent times, I've uh, I, I've actually moved in a slightly different direction here. So I'm, I'm still the, the the manager here for the Galway office, um, but I've taken on a global growth market role where uh, I'm working with the, the 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 business to identify the growth markets for SiteMinder in the future and how we go about approaching our business model uh, from 
first touch marketing right through to sales, onboarding, support, and even product. So rather than our plug and play model that works very well in some of our mature markets, um, entering into new and developing markets is a is and needs to be a very different mindset. So mm-hmm. I'm helping to, I suppose, be that change agent in terms of what that mindset should be and finding out what is that niche that we want to nail in a country or in a region and lining up our focus behind that in terms of our value proposition and the customer teams and product that deliver against that niche and then bringing that to market. So we've just kind of gone through a, a big project with Italy and we're in the process of hiring uh, new brand new roles and, and, and new functions based on that uh, piece of work. And we're looking forward to executing that in the Italian market over the, over the months ahead. Mm-hmm. Nice. And I think I even saw like a VP title in the in your most recent uh, LinkedIn update, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't get to, I'm, I'm definitely not one that gets hung up on titles, but uh, but yeah, no, that, that came as part of my, my shift into the growth market. So that's been really exciting. And I've actually taken up a lecturing position in the last uh, in the last few weeks as well. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing a couple of master classes uh, in the university here in Galway Very on cool. digital sales management and um, so I just finished my second week uh, <laughs> yesterday and uh, really enjoying it very different uh, very different audience yeah. very different organization uh, working with the university but uh, really rewarding uh, very interesting work yeah I'm laughing because we were talking about it I think a week ago or so or two weeks ago and I was saying well you don't you don't seem to have enough on your plate <laughs> <laughs> already um so that you're taking on another another role which you know you sound like you're really excited about and i think that's always a really wonderful example as well that if you are enjoying all of the things that you're doing how much energy you have and yeah, how much things you can actually do yeah it's a great point i think julia i think i think often leaders think that the more pressure and the more focus that you bring on a team the more stress it brings Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all about how that is done and like even a, you know in my own example I do tend to want to have a lot of things on because it does help me focus and I get energized by working with and um, with different people and on different projects and um, I also coach two underage teams as well at the weekends and mm-hmm. somehow get up for night feeds every night as well so I that's just I I, I I certainly do appreciate and prefer to have a lot of diverse um situations that i feel i can contribute positively to and that's a, that's an important thing for me hmm. that's really nice i one question we haven't talked about actually that i want to ask you is um I, a lot of people ask me oh you're being stressed out and you left google um, and is that in, like, does it mean you can only uh, manage your stress properly while moving out of a company? You know, it doesn't have to be Google, you know, you, you moved multiple times. Um, and I would like to ask you, how were your stress, stress levels every time, maybe before you moved roles or before you moved into other companies? And um, do you have an answer to, to that question? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think what probably helped is in the roles that I've had, I've I've come to a position where it's time. I, I felt it's time for me to do something different. So I was at peace with the fact that mm-hmm. the impact I've had and the longevity of me staying in the role, um, we're getting to a point where actually it's best for me and the business that we seek you know uh, uh, we, we see we seek an alternative route into the future um and you know thankfully they're always my decision but because i i i, I guess i i could i could go through that process of actually i'm in a very clear frame of mind where mm. i've enjoyed and i've experienced what i've experienced and through reflection um there's something that I want to experience that's different. So I guess you kind of come to the end of a journey Mm -hmm. while identifying what it is that is missing that you really want to experience differently. So Mm -hmm. if I take the example of when I worked in my last company, Adderall, um, you know, it was very much a, you know, a high intensity, high pressurized kind of sales account management leadership role that I was the director for EMEA on. And I definitely yearned to be able to, I guess, influence more of the experience of the whole office um, and every facet of 
if it fast is the business that actually operates within uh, and on a site. And that's where the, I guess, the general manager role for SiteMinder was very attractive for me because, again, it, it allows you to be able to tell the story and ensure that people are part of that story and they feel part of that story. And I guess that can be quite difficult and I found difficult in the past to uh, sometimes influence uh, other parts of the business and uh, outside of my own kind of business unit. Um, and I felt that, that that was the type of work that I really wanted to be involved in. So mm -hmm. I guess that helped reduce the stress levels, but like to say I would feel very, I suppose, conscious of whether I'm good enough mm -hmm. to do it. Maybe that goes back to the example I shared of leaving radio and then moving to Google and mm -hmm. just totally losing all confidence that I could actually do what yeah. I was employed to do. I don't think that's ever left me. And that would be the underlying piece that I probably have. But I guess it's how you channel that energy. Okay. So you can channel it in a way where it cripples you, or you can actually take the time to actually think about those times in your life when you've made changes. And you know what? You always tend to come out the other end and you tend to get there. So there is light at the end of the tunnel yeah. and it's darkest before the dawn and all of those things. <laughs> but you, 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 you need yeah. to take, I guess, as you become more experienced, your recovery from those situations is the most important thing, the pace of recovery. So we all feel those insecurities. Yeah. It's about how we think about those mechanisms whereby actually I've been in this situation before and this is how I got out of them in the past and it does get better. Mm -hmm. And using that, that kind of, I suppose, my own case studies to be able to give myself confidence that this time I'm in this situation, mm -hmm. I'm also going to think and work my way through it and not let the anxiety of a big role um, and everything that rides with it uh, kind of, I suppose, cloud cl cloud my judgment or, 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 or kind of sidetrack sidetrack me from um, from having the, the biggest positive impact I possibly can. Yeah, I there's a couple of things I want to kind of highlight or like mention as well. So I think one of the things that I love that you said is that you kind of once you made the decision, you were really calm. Um, and, you know, you were really clear on kind of what you wanted to do next. I think it's oftentimes that tumultuous time when you're trying to make a decision and you're feeling like you're being maybe pulled into a few different directions um, where it can be really stressful because we are having a lot of, you know, generally thoughts on our mind of, you know, weighing options and thinking about pros and cons and advantages and disadvantages and thinking about our personal life and our family and our professional career and all these different things. Um, and I think that can create a lot of stress in people. But I th I feel you when you say like, once I've made the decision, I've actually felt really calm and I could look at my experience back like in a very appreciative and grateful way. And I felt the exact same way. I didn't know for a long time what I wanted to do next. Um, But once I made the decision, I was very confident and I could move move on. Um, needless to say, you know, building your own business is a very <laughs> stressful undertaking yeah. as well. So I'm always saying to people, you know, like it's not it's not like I'm not experiencing stress anymore now that I have moved out of a big organization and building my own company. Um, and the other thing that you said that I found really um, powerful is you're going into kind of a un, like a discomfort and you're going into an uncomfortable zone, right? And we're always talking about this as well, like the quote of like, you have to get out of your comfort zone to have magic happen. But I think also that experience of doing it over and over again and leaving the comfort zone and experiencing that you are able to create something new um, gives you more confidence as well for the next time you're thinking about doing it again. And I think yeah. it's an important experience in life that yeah. you know you don't have to end up in a role or in a job that you're doing for 20 30 40 years of your life like i see my family do these things and talk about stress right because you're doing always the same things and you're not really happy anymore and i think we are actually in a really powerful position nowadays where every few years we can do something very different um and we have a lot of different opportunities and meet new people and all these really cool things Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Julia. I think, you know, I I, 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 I think, like I said, and, and you mentioned there, I think you can get a lot of energy and, and, and kind of invigoration by taking on new challenges and constantly making yourself, you know, that little bit vulnerable where 
you need to actually really focus and you really need to kind of kick on and progress to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that having that in a healthy balance is is a positive thing, Mm -hmm. but it's ensuring it's in a healthy balance um, Mm -hmm. and ensuring that you as a person, as more so even personally than professionally, are in a place where you can take those things on um, and you can personally deal with ambiguity and be, you know, nervous but still excited about the fact that you need to figure something brand new out because mm-hmm. I think listen I, I I think you, you spoke about maybe your parents or your grandparents and and and, and, and that generation no more than um, I would have experienced myself I think a job is a job for life and, mm-hmm. and, and 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 quite often it can be it's about how you invigorate your experience in work mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean you need to leave a company or do mm-hmm. something that or mimic what someone else does if you can constantly find ways of reinventing and looking for different challenges Mm -hmm. um, and adding value. Like for me at the end of the day, it's a lot about impact, making a difference. So if you bring your A game, you make a difference. If you don't bring your A game, you Mm -hmm. make a difference for the wrong reasons. So it's, it's being able to create something that if you didn't do something, it wouldn't happen. And I think having elements of that in your life, full stop, whether it's, you know, if it's in your professional life, it certainly helps in your personal life as well, because, you know, we're all role models in different capacities and mm-hmm. you don't want to just clock in, clock out and just kind of go through the motions. You want to try and create and do something that mm-hmm. leaves people and situations in a better place because you actually cared enough to do something rather than you didn't. So mm-hmm. I think, I, you know, I, I have huge admiration for you and for anyone that's brave to set up their own business. I think it's something I, I, I you know, I, I, I haven't done. I, w- I would aspire to do it someday. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's, there, there's, there's such bravery that comes with it, but it comes from a place and like even, you're, you know, you've, you, you probably don't like me saying it, but you've had some really impressive success over the last, um, over the last, uh, over the last number of months and last year. Um, is that you know that's that takes you know a certain level of calmness and belief that what you're doing is something you're really passionate about, and I think the new currency today is passion. Mm-hmm. Like it is, is the currency that matters in any organization, whether you're starting up your own or whether you're in a big organization that you want people to follow leaders or people follow leaders that are passionate and they're authentic, which authenticity for me is the most attractive trait personally or professionally so they're they're the currencies that that have the highest weight i believe in leadership um and having that having those in the right balance can create phenomenal things that people just want to be around people or work with people Mm -hmm. that um push those things into the into the world Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Yeah, I I am super passionate about what I'm doing for sure. Um and that helps me that gives me the energy right that I need in order to go through all of the ups and downs that you experience um while setting up a business. But yeah. Um one of the things that we wanted to chat a little bit more about today was um the stress of being kind of a middle manager. Um mm-hmm. so I think I've I've I'm working with a lot of people, I'm coaching a lot of one-to-one clients in kind of this area as well, lots of middle management where they have people that um they're that reporting into them and that they're managing, but then they also have to report into kind of senior management and Oftentimes I hear those people say that that's probably the most stressful position of all because you're kind of being stretched and being pulled into two different directions where you have to constantly wear two different types of hats as well. And so I wanted to talk a little bit with you because you have obviously a lot of experience uh, managing people, being in very different positions, being in different companies. What have you seen worked well? And maybe what have you seen that didn't didn't work well? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like, I, I think that frontline middle management role is probably one of the most stressful positions in any business. And there's plenty of studies out there that kind of back up the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you described, you've got that pressure bottom up from the people you lead and the pressure top down to drive performance. And you're trying to be that conduit that kind of keeps everyone happy. Um, but quite often, the middle management are the most miserable individuals mm-hmm. um, and least motivated individuals because they're trying to they're trying to serve so many masters 
and therefore they're they're ending up not actually doing a good job at pleasing anyone or getting performance at the end of the day. So mm-hmm. I, I, I guess the things that I've seen work well, and I guess the counter of those are some things I haven't seen work well, but where I've seen it work well is I think where companies recognize that the most influential individuals in an organization are middle management and frontline managers. Mm-hmm. Like no matter what I do or the CEO does or the founder does or says, it can't affect how people feel about their jobs every day. That's the influence and power of a frontline manager, a direct manager has. Mm-hmm. And how that manager feels about themselves, about their position in their careers is such an influencer of how they go and affect the people they manage. So that's the scale effect. So for me, some of the most impactful things that have worked well is where learning and development and leadership opportunities uh, and investment uh, has been injected into that frontline management layer where you get them really invigorated about their position mm-hmm. um, and their future. So they really believe in the company, the company's investing in them, uh, and they see a long-term partnership together with the company. And on top of that, it's one thing investing in as a business, but you need to be able to actually give them genuine empowerment to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And that can be one of the most difficult things for middle management to do is that they're in this straitjacket situation where they can't make decisions. They're just managing the business unit and they can't change things. And stuff that I've seen work really well is where you give very clear carved out decision-making power to frontline managers um, where, and with that comes a great deal of accountability. So then make, you're better off making your own mistakes than someone else's mistakes. So mm-hmm. I think that there's certainly elements of any role when it comes to middle management that upper management and executives can empower and give very clear and very visible responsibility to the middle managers Mm -hmm. whether it's a incentive budget that they decide what happens for their teams and they design the amounts and the the incentive programs that drive the drive the behaviors Mm -hmm. rather than it coming from top down and everyone just has to follow what the the big boss says Mm -hmm. whether it's a part of travel budget where the middle managers decide who travels where and when based on the strategy they want to Mm -hmm. achieve for their teams um, whether it's an education fund that I can actually go and put people on their teams uh, uh, into private training courses because it's part of their personal development plan. And so, again, I think what, I, what is really important is giving a middle manager a true identity because what I can see and often see doesn't work well. Um, and thankfully, in SiteMind, we don't have this problem, but I've seen in the past is where frontline staff don't see their direct manager as having any control or decision-making power. Mm -hmm. So they actually bypass their manager to go to the director or the VP. And they actually don't, they they don't value their manager. They don't know why they should value their manager because they don't believe that manager can help them. So I think where it works really well, like I said, is where an organization empowers very clearly managers to be able to make critical decisions that affect the lives and success and performance of the people they manage. Mm -hmm. And that also it's very important that you give them a seat at the table in terms of what's coming down the line, the vision, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And from a communications perspective, that you have a cascade effect of communicating important changes through the middle management first. Mm -hmm. And they then have the responsibility to communicate that to their people. Again, they're coming with something that's valuable, that's important, and they're the they're the they're they're the they're the carriers of that important message, and they they're accountable then for the the the, the, the delivery and the follow through whatever that might look like. Mm-hmm. So again, it's how do you build that empowerment stack of responsibilities for a middle manager, mm-hmm. and let's we'll say VPs or the directors that manage middle managers. It's like the best leaders. They don't have to be, they shouldn't be the loudest often and they don't need to be in the center of attention. It's about how you empower the people around you to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I think that the secret of success for middle managers being able to handle those stressful situations is these executives and senior management team 
having a very clear philosophy that that middle management there are the key influencers in the business. Hmm. And we need to make them feel a certain way about themselves and the company mm-hmm. um, in a genuine, authentic way and empower them mm-hmm. and give them the space to go and express themselves and not feel like they're part of a cog in a wheel. They actually can go make mistakes, but they can also um, create great successes and use their brains and use their ideas. And so it's about creating the environment yeah. for very talented middle managers to thrive. And that doesn't mean t- it being a less pressurized environment. It, it means creating more, m- more ability for a manager to, to, to be able to make decisions and handle the situations and feel that they can, they're more in control. And I think it's that they're the tools that get, that, that will help a middle manager handle stress mm-hmm. and handle pressure top down and bottom up. Because mm-hmm. they have an identity and they have they have an element of influence. Mm-hmm. Without that, it will continue to be an incredibly demoralizing situation. That I've often seen really good potential middle managers leave management mm-hmm. and never go back into management again mm-hmm. because of what can be a really really personally damaging experience and high, particularly if it's a high stress situation. So. Mm-hmm. So yeah, some of, some of those things have worked well, um, and when they're not present, um, it can be really frustrating for middle managers, I believe. Yeah, um, I'm sure that you know some people might listen now and they're thinking, okay, like I understand that, and I wish I would have that power, or I wish I would have that influence, or I wish I would have that structure in place in my company, but it's not that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we talk theor- theoretically right now. Um, do you have any tips or things that you think about that people can do, you know, without leaving the job, but that they can try to do in, to, in order to bring that change into their teams and into their organization? Yeah. Um, and and so I totally get that. Like, as I said, I think what we speak about is an ideal world where mm-hmm. you're able to make those changes. And, you know, in certain organizations, it really is very, very difficult to make those changes at scale. If there's lots of middle managers and, mm-hmm. Um, so I get that, I guess what, you know, what, what it comes down to as well as having that honest, genuine relationship with upper management. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's changes that even in more compromised positions where you might be, might be able to go to the the degree that we just described, but having a very open and honest relationship with, from, from a middle management perspective with their direct manager, really work with that manager to understand what's coming down the line. So these are things that I think can happen in any organization. Um, and I think getting p- particularly the communication channels of, of, of what's communicated to the team coming through as much as possible, the middle managers. So these are things that it's the flow of communication. It's a relationship. These are things that I believe can happen. And I believe any middle manager that might be listening should take the responsibility to, to, to really insist on having some of those potentially easy wins in place. Mm-hmm. Um, but also being comfortable with yourself to be honest. And even if it's not good news with your manager, I think sometimes, you know, always saying that everything's okay or that you have it or you look after, it, you know, it, it's not being, genuinely honest and having that relationship with your manager that actually creates an awful lot of distress because mm-hmm. you know the fact of the matter is the majority of our worries actually never happen about things that mm-hmm. may happen or could happen that don't actually happen yeah. and i think when you're not in a position of 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 safety or you don't feel safe or you don't feel secure um that can often be because you just you're not having this honest conversation with your key stakeholders and therefore you can feel a little insecure because they might find out that maybe you, you haven't got it. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think big tip uh, tips I would give is having that kind of really honest kind of agreement with your manager, asking for feedback, ask, give me feedback when it's going well, let me know if I'm behind the curve, let mm-hmm. me know if I'm doing well. Mm-hmm. But let's have that constant dialogue so we know if we're on track or if we're not. 
and what we need to do about it. So let there be no surprises. So I would say really look to engineer a relationship with your key stakeholders where you minimize surprises that are within your control or your stakeholders control. Um, and, and then certainly I, I, I think, you know, really through that, ensuring that there are a handful of important communications that the middle manager takes on board for their team that mm -hmm. starts to help shape their identity and their influence. Mm -hmm. Even if you can't give some of the other things we spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. there are some things that I think any, and, and, and any sales or sorry, any, any leader full stop of middle managers worth their salt um, should be very open and keen to work with their people on regardless of the type of organization, the size, the location. Mm -hmm. There are things that between two humans, they should be able to figure out without breaking the system. Yeah. One of the things that I'm hearing and one of the things obviously that I have also experienced with you, you know, is being really vulnerable and being able to really communicate what is really going on, you know, how are we really feeling on a personal level? And, you know, I think that's why our relationship has been so strong over the years. Um, and something that I really firmly believe in to bring more into companies as well. And because I feel like oftentimes we are, like you said, we don't feel safe or we don't feel secure. And then we don't dare to share something um, because we feel like we are exposing ourselves and then we don't really know what's going to happen as the next step of that. Um, you know, you are for me kind of the leading role model of bringing vulnerability into work and, um, you know, and showing that that really works um, most of the time, at least, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure maybe you're thinking about things that are not working so well, but um, do you have maybe an example um, of your, in your own career where you had to make, maybe a tough decision to talk to someone and share something vulnerable, but that really brought you forward? Yeah, I think, you know, we talked a bit earlier about stuff like passion and authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and part of being authentic in yourself is it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can often build a lot more trust and engagement from the people that you work with or you lead when you don't try to BS them and mm -hmm. give them a line just to make them feel a certain way. Like, um, and I've, I, I, I've certainly experienced that a number of times. Um, you know, I, 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 I certainly know in, in the last company I was, I was in, we, we, we had made some important and the right decisions when it came to changing some compensation plans and and that really affected the sales world globally um and i think on reflection the way we rolled that out uh, to all the different offices um just really didn't land the way it was intended mm -hmm. um, and it created a very difficult situation where uh, a lot of people felt that they were being really hard done by and done over and you could really feel the culture shifting and becoming quite toxic um, because there's one thing that you want to be really careful of when you change in an organization that will is incredibly emotive and that's a sales compensation plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I recall very clearly that, you know, what was needed there because it, it was, it was getting quite um, them against us um, frontline salespeople against the management Mm -hmm. uh, locally, globally, and it was it, it was kind of creating kind of a very big barrier of communication uh, in terms of how it was being kind of rolled out. So I think what worked really well there is it's not about putting pretty slides together sometimes. It's not about mm -hmm. having polished and I'm far from polished and that's I talked about that a little while but I gave up because I just I, I can't mimic some phenomenal presenters out there um but people need to believe you when you talk to them mm -hmm. and for me in that situation it was about creating an environment which was round table honest conversation around where we're at what we can do to get out of it together And I think that's the point of those vulnerable situations. I think you need to acknowledge the situation you're in, 
you need you genuinely need to put your hands up and say sorry and mm-hmm. saying sorry isn't a weakness mm-hmm. you know there's something that could have been done better acknowledge what could have been done better mm-hmm. don't pretend that the way that it was done was perfect because you wouldn't be sitting around that table with 20 or 30 people looking at you like they want to kill you um, <laughs> if it was done perfect yeah. you need to diffuse the situation by being honest and talking to them like adults mm-hmm. and saying it wasn't perfect if we do it again would we do it differently absolutely we do 100 things differently but we are where we are today mm-hmm. and we need together and this is where I think it really helps is bringing the together and doing it, working with people in vulnerable situations to get out of it together. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes top down gets yourself into a situation, but together gets you out of it. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult from top down leadership to pull groups out of those situations if they've actually put them into a difficult situation because trust can be compromised. And mm-hmm. that element of, yeah, that, that element of belief of, Anything else that's said uh, can be hinged with, uh, with, with a, a sentiment of um, of disbelief. So, I, I think that's probably an example when you need to read the situation and the body language. Like often, it's not what's said; it's what's not said, and it's yeah. how people are carrying themselves. Mm-hmm. It's been very like it, it's really been able to gauge the environment by the body language and the way that people are talking, Mm -hmm. not what they're saying, but often the tone Mm -hmm. and the eye contact or lack thereof. And Mm -hmm. you need to be able to very quickly get to that space so you can connect with where they're at to be able to ever pull people out of it. And again, you need to meet them where they're at and where the group is at kind of, lay the I suppose get a, get a level playing field of this is where we are together mm-hmm. before you can actually go and lead them out of that situation but it's it, it, it's difficult um mm-hmm. but the big tip I would give in all of that is active listening mm-hmm. but with your eyes and your ears mm-hmm. like don't talk that much just listen <laughs> like genuinely it's really difficult and I struggle at it <laughs> as you as you well know <laughs> but in situations like that get super quiet ask open questions mm-hmm. and really start to get to the root cause of where, 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 where that situation, how that situation has occurred, thinking through how together we can get out of it. So mm-hmm. making it as simple and as vulnerable as possible to get to the honest truth. A couple of things that c- kind of come up for me, I think, you know, people are just people at the end of the day, no matter if you're on like senior management or middle management or frontline sales people, you know, I think what we often forget is it's just that it's people behind everything <laughs> and that we all make mistakes and we're all not perfect. So I know that it's always easy to say, but then if you find yourself in a difficult situation, it you know, that's not the first thing that we think about. And I think instead of, you know, kind of attacking and being upset and like, like lashing out I think it's really about having also sitting also down and being like you know what happened there and trying to understand the situation instead of just um blaming you know blaming and shaming and um yeah and then I think really quickly what happens as well when those big changes happen in an organization is is something happened right it's it's in the past at that point and the question is okay there's clearly something that we didn't do right and you said I love that you said you know like saying yes i'm sorry and yes like acknowledging that something was done incorrectly or not maybe the best way possible is really important to say so people kind of create that trust again and then move forward and not kind of stick to what happened in the past and how bad it was for you but to kind of mo- like move on from it and and forgive in that situation as well and i think the last thing that is on my mind that i want to say is at the end of the day, it's always, you know, 10% stimulus and 90% reaction. Like how do we react to a change or how do we react to something? Um, and if we are just kind of in that victim position um, and we're complaining about something, it's not going to bring us anywhere, right? We are probably just going to be the person <laughs> that is yeah. maybe not that popular anymore because they're just complaining and being the victim and, you know, and <clears throat> being unhappy instead of the person that steps up in that situation or in that difficult moment. And yeah. I have an idea 
um, or let let's do something differently. Um, yeah, and I think especially it, when it comes yeah. from from that, it, it's so much more powerful. Everyone around. Yeah, I agree, Julia. I think unfortunately, misery finds misery, mm. and I think it's people. You know, sometimes if, if if people are angry about a situation, they quite often look for others to feel the way they feel. Mm. Um, to to, I suppose vindicate it back to themselves that it is the right way to feel um, and it's much more mm-hmm. difficult to break away from the contagiousness that is mm-hmm. we've been wronged or there's something bad or someone's out to get us or whatever can start to actually develop from um, from those situations so yeah like it's it's I, I, I think it, again it, it goes back a lot to I think a culture that Mm-hmm. A person and or a company has and i say to every starter here that's, that, that starts with us here is that bring your true self your real self to the office from day one be yourself mm-hmm. because if you are your authentic self people will build a relationship with you because they know you mm-hmm. um, and that could be a great relationship it could be an effective work relationship in terms of colleagues but there's an element of trust and connection that can be super deep um, on a personal and or professional level. Mm-hmm. And when, if you go about operating, I suppose, your business and your life like that, people will give you leeway if something bad happens or there's a tough situation because they know who you are and what you stand for. And you've been consistently delivering that over the period of time that you've known them, those that individual or group of individuals. And I think that is really important because that's the credit you need in the bank to be able to draw down in tough situations. Because if you haven't built up that credibility and trust and the, you know, whatever hits the fan, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually get down and get people to follow you out of it because if mm-hmm. they don't trust you, they won't follow you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, and thanks so much for this honest conversation. I really think that a lot of people will get a lot of value out of it. Um, I always have a few questions at the end of the podcast. So I'm going to move into those questions because I want to be mindful of your time. Um, the first question is, what are you most grateful for? Um, I, I would say certainly family and friends is probably a cliche, but um, like th- there's very few things that I get upset or really, I never really lose my temper, but I imagine if I were to lose my temper, it would be if uh, anything to affect family or friends. Um, and um, it's certainly something that I am really grateful for. Um, I could be a better friend, I could be a better dad, a better husband, all of those things. Um, but it's stuff that I, I fundamentally try and invest as much as I can in um, without expecting anything in return. Mm-hmm. And do you have three wisdoms that you live by or three kind of ways of life that have come, that have been really powerful for you? Yeah, um, I suppose... First of all, I think you can't change the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and worrying about uh, worrying about that is is futile. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't sometimes beat yourself up or reflect honestly about something that might not as ha- have gone so well. But I think once a situation happens, you need to accept that you can't go and change it, but you have a responsibility to react. It's how you react to situations um, in the go forward, present, and into the future that is so important, regardless of what that situation is, good, bad, or indifferent. So that's probably one of them, I would say, is don't beat yourself up too much in the past. Mm -hmm. Beat yourself up if you don't react in a positive way to shape the present and the future, um, Mm -hmm. um, regardless of the situation. Um, Secondly, then, I would say, is and we touched on it a couple of times i think here is is be yourself mm-hmm. and don't try to mimic or be anyone else because that's you are who you are and it doesn't mean and it obviously means there's lots of areas all of us can improve and grow and develop in 
but be true to yourself, your morals, your motivations, your you know your your beliefs uh, and your values. They're things that you shouldn't compromise on. And it can be difficult. We touched on that with middle management and other situations that can be mm-hmm. tricky. But there's fundamental values that you have that um, make you who you are. And once you do, if you are to compromise those values, you lose a lot more uh, than you might realize because that is your identity. It's your brand. It's who you are. Mm-hmm. And once people... L- once once people that are important to you whether it's family and friends in particular in my case start to I suppose question who you are um because you've compromised values that's when you've gone down the wrong road so mm-hmm. I think being your authentic and true self is is the second one um and then the third one is genuine need to be emotionally connected and enjoy what you do um mm-hmm and laugh more every day that you can Mm -hmm. like really try to enjoy it um and take a responsibility to to ensure that people around you are enjoying themselves as well because Mm -hmm. it's a long life if you're miserable um and it's a long day um that makes up that life and um you know bringing bringing joy and happiness into your own life first and foremost and then trying to, to to do that for others is 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 an important gift um, that um, you should be as uh, as forthcoming with as you possibly can, um, because we, we we you know we we all need to try and think of life as glass half full and um, and not let uh, as we said earlier the the ninety nine percent of worries uh, get on top of us that actually never manifest themselves as actual events. So mm-hmm. they're probably the three things I would say. Yeah. And I, I just want to highlight, I think being genuine is a word that I learned from you. Um, I think that was not in my, you know, kind of my the words that I knew in English um, when I first got to Ireland. And something that I always think of, I always think of you when I hear genuine. It's really, a, I think it's really the culture that you've created. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. So thank really you, Jules. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, do you have any books or a book that you've read that has changed your life or maybe that you're reading over and over again because you always find like new things in the book that really inspire you? Yeah, um, there's one or two. I, I generally tend to listen to books, although I say I read them. I've actually listened to audio books a lot I and podcasts because um, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling a lot and mm-hmm. uh, uh, three little kids at home so life is busy um but um what i've read and i've read a number of times is a a book called legacy by an author called james kerr Mm -hmm. um it's a relatively focused short book um but it it it, it follows the uh the uh the the culture of the the uh the new zealand rugby team um Mm -hmm. and how they've had their ups and downs and how they go about creating rituals Mm. um and how they think about leadership and their responsibility to their country to their communities and and it goes far far beyond um being a a famous athlete um and what makes fame uh, and what makes and what is important is the person you are and the difference you make and the responsibility you have to uh, others uh, and, and, and to avoid, I suppose, the individualistic um, kind of uh, chasing of, of accolades and, and stuff that comes with that. So mm-hmm. I definitely learned a lot about teams and it's quite humbling to see, you know, arguably the, the, the greatest ever rugby team in the world um, actually being a, a group of leaders that are incredibly humble um, and really know where they came from and know the importance of the jersey they bring on and, and bring, they put on and the history of where it came from. And there's a lot to be learned from that, appreciating where you've come from and the responsibility you have today. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been a really interesting read a few times or listen. Um, another really interesting book I'm reading at the moment, um, it's probably more of a, a business book, is called From uh, Impossible to Inevitable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's by two authors, Aaron Ross and Jason Nemkin. Um, and it's, 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 it's very much focused on hyper growth companies and how they go about creating, um, 
the uh, the foundations that lead that, that that set them up for success, and also giving the other side of uh, when growth can turn ugly and uh, and and can cause incredible issues, particularly around cultures um, and in, in in a lot of uh, either uh, you know fast 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 growing startups or large companies that are that are scaling. Um, and again, I, I, I just, I guess I, I learned a lot about that in terms of focus, the importance of focus, mm-hmm. the importance of as an individual and as an organization being really clear on the identity that the business you represent has and the role that you play to deliver that identity in whatever facet of the business you work and to be really continuously focused on doing that. Um, and the importance that creates in terms of everyone in that organization knowing where they fit in, the what, the why, the where, and the how, mm-hmm. and, and 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 knowing that is a very important piece to I think motivation. We touched on it earlier. I think around impact, mm-hmm. being able to know the impact you make and by bringing your A game, you make a difference. I, I think being able to tell that story is really powerful. So that's definitely something I, I, I appreciated from from that book, uh, From Impossible to Inevitable, um, of the importance of setting the right foundation uh, and getting it right from the beginning and going slow before you can go fast. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Okay, great. Um, if anyone is listening right now and they would like to get in touch with you, <laughs> I know that you're always very, you know, um, accommodating to everyone. Um, hopefully not too many, but if anyone would like to reach out to you, how would they best do that? Yeah, really happy for anyone to reach out. Genuinely, I, 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 I absolutely love um, uh, connecting uh, with people um, and sharing stories and experiences. I, I, I learn and develop a lot from doing it. So feel free to reach out. I'd say best way is, uh, is, is, is on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, so do reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, under Ruri Conroy. Um, but also you can get me on email. So it's Ruri Conroy at gmail.com. So R-U-A-I-R-I-C-O-N-R-O-Y at gmail.com. Great. Thank you. And I will add that to the show notes as well. So people can find that link very easily. Super. Ruri, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Um, it's been a really wonderful conversation. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will take a lot out of it. And um, yeah, I'm, like I said, extremely happy and grateful that we met and that our life keep crossing each other and we're still in touch after such a long period of time. And I'm really excited to see where life takes you. And um, yeah, hope to see you again in person really soon as well. Likewise, Julia. Thanks so much for having me and listen, keep up the great, the good work. Again, like I said earlier, really proud and in awe of the work you're doing and the difference it makes um, to people um, is dramatic. So keep 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 spreading the, the good word and, 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 and fighting the good fight because it, 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 it makes a, a huge difference to how, how people feel. So uh, thanks very much for having me as a guest today. Thank you, Thank you so much, Rory. Have a good evening and a nice weekend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, I would be extremely happy and grateful if you could leave me a comment and a five-star rating. If you know someone who would benefit from the information I talked about today, please feel free to share it with them, no matter if it is your friends, your colleagues, and or your family members. You will always find all links and a summary of the podcast in the show notes. It would be great if we could connect on Instagram or via email. You can find all details of how to find me in the show notes as well. In that way, you can also send me any questions that you might have. And as I mentioned, I also have a wonderful YouTube channel now where you can post comments and questions. So please reach out. I'm glad you're listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for your trust. With gratitude, Julia.